for dozens of um, Ariane launches. And we'll ask him some more questions about the, the, the tension and the responsibility of launching these uh, machines, which are so sophisticated and so expensive. Yeah, certainly looking There's forward a, to that conversation. Yeah. Ten, year, 10 years of work on this uh, RN6, uh, it's uh, with a lot of novelties, so. Uh, concluding, topping off on de DDO, all the various. Attention for the sequence final, lanceur. Top I0 minus 5 minutes. And that voice you heard just now was the DDO that Frederick was just explaining to us, the director of operations. So we're going to do our best to not audibly step over them. So if you hear us abruptly stop our commentary, we just want to make sure we are listening in and hearing those call-outs as they come. Just got a, a quick glance at some of the teams that have made this launch possible. Obviously, thousands of people all around the world are watching the progress of this launch and the countdown now just a little more than four minutes away from lifting off. The upper stage locks tank topping up finished up about T minus four minutes, 50 seconds. Same with the lower stage LOX tank and the lower stage LH2 tank. We're just a little more than 30 seconds away from the upper stage liquid hydrogen tank topping off, wrapping up. And at that point, the Ariane 6 rocket will be fully loaded with all of its propellant and getting ready to lift off just a little more than three minutes to that point. point teams are also in the process of synchronizing the launch sequence so control of operations has now switched over from the ground to the rocket itself now a little less than three minutes to the planned liftoff of this inaugural flight of the Ariane 6 rocket again coming up we'll see the volcano main engine ignite at t minus seven seconds and then the two solid rocket boosters will ignite at T0, and we'll see a liftoff at that point as well. If you see from the strong back there, the yellow lines that extend out to the rocket, those are the feed lines. Those will, of course, retract prior to launch. Now less than two minutes to lift off. Taking a close-up look at that Vulcane engine. That will be igniting at the T minus seven second mark. Now less than a minute and a half. And as we come into the final minute here, let's go ahead and listen in to the final countdown and any call-outs from the DDO. A tous de DDO, attention pour moins d'une minute. Stop, I zero moins d'une minute. Can you hear me?
à tous de DDO, attention pour le décompte final. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, top Allumage 2 ESR, décollage Nominal. Trajectoire nominale. Pilotage calme, trajectoire nominale. Trajectoire nominale, pilotage calme. Trajectoire nominale. We're now a little more than a minute and a half into this inaugural flight of an Ariane 6 rocket. So far, as you're hearing in French, everything is nominal with this mission. Coming up in less than 30 seconds, at about T plus 2 minutes and 16 seconds, those two solid rocket boosters on the side of the first stage will separate. The fairings will be deployed at T plus 3 minutes 39 seconds. Nominal. About 10 seconds to booster separation. And there goes those two solids. Separation des USR. And a bit of applause heard in the Jupiter room. Propulsion nominale, trajectoire nominale. And there you see some onboard camera views of that moment we just saw. Trajectoire nominale. Next milestone coming up in less than 40 seconds when the payload fairings will separate exposing the payloads to the vacuum of space for the first time on this flight. One of the payloads is a camera system on board that is designed to capture about 180 minutes of this mission. From the area of the payload. There you can see those. De la there go the fairings. Hopefully we'll get an onboard camera view of that as well. They've switched, of course, to this animated version of what they're expecting to see. You can see one of those payload fairings falling away from now. This is a real-time onboard camera. Trajectoire nominal, propulsion nominal. You can see the telemetry data in the map above the two boxes you see here in the center of your screen on the left are the onboard camera views and now the DDO inside the control room. 
on the right hand side those are computer model renderings of the payloads that are hitching a ride on board this inaugural flight of an Ariane 6. Vulcan 2.1 engine will continue this burn until about seven and a half minutes into flight, at which point it will cut off, and then six seconds later, the upper stage will separate. It'll be followed less than 10 seconds after that by the first ignition of the Vinci engine. Frederick, bringing you back into into the conversation as we're awaiting the uh, next couple of events here with the engine cutoff and then stage separation. Just your initial thoughts on, you know, what we were hoping to see so far on the flight, a, a good liftoff, a good booster separation. They've got to be ecstatic yeah, there down in French Guiana. I'm sure. And here too, in the, in the VIP room, uh, people are very happy, but they know that it's far from over. But uh, the critical, uh, the critical launch, the the first steps are looking pretty good. Uh, they already now they are close to uh, 180 kilometers uh, altitude, and um, and things everything looks good. Propulsion, trajectory, um, data are good. So let's. Uh, Cross our fingers to see if it keeps going this um, this way. And the amazing thing from uh, uh, just uh, viewers like us is that they, they have improved by far. We see that uh, SpaceX uh, effect uh, made cameras improving their, the views of the launch, separation, boosters. Uh, every time they seem to be artificial uh, views and it's, uh, they improve their cameras, obviously. And uh, the angles and uh, and the telemetry to get these pictures down, these images down. Yeah, you mentioned the the SpaceX effect. I think certainly, you know, with the numerous Falcon Nine launches that we see on a weekly basis, combined with yeah. obviously the recent flight of Starship and getting those spectacular views through reentry, I think have really raised the bar for launch providers on what the the public now, you know, almost yeah. expects for for these yeah. missions. Uh, we just heard that um, uh, the range, uh, the, the range is uh, the people in charge of the range in Kourou are the, the mission is over. They don't have to intervene anymore. And it looks like a good first ignition of the Vinci engine as well. Yeah, on the stage separation. Though, so that's, of course, critical a second step. Nominal. Okay, the, 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 the amazing of stage thing, separation uh, there. The amazing thing uh, is that in Paris, you hear the, the, the window where I'm working uh, are open, and you hear the people shouting all over Paris, but not because uh, Ariane success is because they have a soccer game very important <laughs> where France is involved. So it's amazing to see. <laughs> well, hopefully at the game, they have a, a second or a part of the screen where they can put up the launch for those wanting to watch. I'm not sure about that, but <laughs> we'll see. Well, Maybe folks will have their smartphones with them so they can be looking up at the pitch and then down at their phones to see what's happening. Exactly, yes. So where we are right now in the mission, we're T plus nine minutes, 15 seconds and counting. With uh, the amazing Vinci views. Engine. Yeah, we're getting some great live views of the Vinci engine on its first burn in space now with this mission. And it will continue this uh, burn until about T plus 18 minutes, 32 seconds into flight when it will cut off. And then it will go into a coast phase for uh, the better part of about 40 minutes.
but as you're saying, just you know, some spectacular views of our little planet down below as it continues its ascent. And it is also interesting to see the trajectory, which is exactly what the launch controllers get on their screen. It's a live trajectory, and uh, sometime when on previous uh, launches where things they had some anomalies, you could see the anomaly right away on this kind of trajectory because you see the nominal one and you see the real one with the little uh, cross. So things are still looking good at this point, more than 10 minutes after liftoff. Yeah, and as you said, you know, good at this point, quite a ways to go as uh, the mission timeline extends out to T plus two hours and 40 minutes. The last separation command will be issued right about two hours, 40 minutes after uh, we saw the liftoff, and that'll be to release the two capsules. If you recall for folks watching at the top of the uh, upper stage, you saw those sort of roundish items one that was sort of like a small white dome another was more of a tan dome those are the two capsules that will be released back one is the nyx bikini and the other is space case or scx01 and those will be the last to be released in this mission As we're awaiting this next milestone, want to take a quick peek at our live chat here. I know it's been a minute since I've popped over and talked to all of you, but really appreciate those who have been with us for our live coverage as we've cruised on for a little more than an hour so far. I want to give a special shout to our wonderful member community here on YouTube as well, since you allow us to do what we do here at Space Flight now. So thanks to folks like John G., Jeff Hansen, I'm Lita. Deborah Jean, Red Dawn, that Opal guy, and many others. Channel membership, of course, comes with a number of perks, including discounts at our online shop, shop.spaceflightnow.com, access to member-only videos here on YouTube, and, of course, the ability to watch all of our Cape-based launch liftoffs in 4K. Speaking of the next launch from the Cape, we are tracking that mission for in the wee hours of Sunday morning coming up this weekend. Before then, though, we have another Falcon 9 launch with a batch of Starlink satellites on board. That is the Starlink 9-3 mission, which is coming up, lifting off from Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. That is coming up the ev uh, tomorrow evening, as a matter of fact. So we'll have live launch coverage, of course, for both of those missions. And as one other bit of programming note, there, of course, is going to be a couple of important updates coming tomorrow on the crew flight test of Boeing Starliner spacecraft. We'll be hearing directly from NASA astronauts Butch Wilmore and Sonny Williams tomorrow morning, currently still on the International Space Station. And then we'll be hearing from Steve Stitch, the head of NASA's commercial crew program as well as from Mark Nappy, head of CCP from the Boeing side of things. So looking to learn more about the mission currently in progress, some of the testing that they've been doing on the thrusters on the Starliner spacecraft that they've been working down at White Sands to get as much data as they can before they create a timeline for the return of Butch and Sonny for a touchdown on the southwest. Fin de visibilité par la station de Saint-Jean du Maroni. Turning back to this mission now, L plus 14 minutes, 34 seconds and counting. Frederick, that map that we saw just a moment or two ago that looked like it was showing a the next ground station coming up. Is that in fact what we were seeing? Because we're we're now back to the animated version of the upper stage. So 
I'm guessing we're in a bit of a handover period, essentially, from one ground tracking satellite to another, or ground tracking dish, I should say. Yes, 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 indeed, yes. We are in between two missions, and uh, we see the inclination is pretty high because obviously the trajectory will go over Europe in the next uh, half hour, as we can see it. It's uh, going uh, north. Um, but of course, they have some ground station, uh, not only in North Africa, but especially you have some ESA station in Spain to, to track. So soon, I believe they will be able to uh, to follow what's going on, especially on this first mission. They want to know exactly what is going on. If there was a failure, they need the telemetry, the constant telemetry, all the data. Yeah, obviously that's incredibly important to make sure they've got a good stream of that. Yeah, I'm trying to. So we are just about two and a half minutes right now until the cutoff of the Vinci engine. Then it will go into yeah. its first coast phase. So again, this is not a short mission by any stretch of the imagination, but an important one going to demonstrate a lot of capabilities of the upper stage of the Ariane 6 with three separate separation commands of the CubeSat payloads. And then, of course, the capsule separation capping things off. And there's that ground station we were just talking about, right? The Santa Maria. in the Portuguese island. Azores. Il reste moins d'une minute du moteur de l'étage supérieur, Vinci. It looks like they've got a good acquisition of signal from the ground now, getting those on camera or on board views from the upper stage of Ariane now. We're about 20 seconds away from that engine cutoff. A lot of principles there in that front row. I can only imagine what's going through their minds at this point in time. Extinction du Vinci. So some clapping and some satisfaction there. Looks like a good cutoff of the upper stage engine. At this point, as you just heard, they're still in a nominal phase of the mission going into that first coast phase at this point in time. Vinci engine will reignite at T plus 56 minutes, 20 seconds, and that'll be a comparatively short burn lasting just 22 seconds in total. But helping to maintain the correct temperatures on the cryogenics on the upper stage, the First auxiliary propulsion unit was powered up just before the nine minute mark into this flight. 
and it will stay active until T plus one hour, five minutes, and 36 seconds. And that'll be just before the first separation command is issued. And those will all come in fairly rapid succession at that point.
for now l plus 25 minutes 56 seconds and counting you can see the upper stage passing over the british isles right now as we are continuing to track this coast phase for the rocket coming up on the next time this vinci engine will ignite it's coming up at T plus 56 minutes and 20 seconds. And again, that will be a relatively brief 22 second burn. Taking a look at the live chat, want to thank a few folks for your support this afternoon. Appreciate Flippers79, Flip Diaz, for gifting a Space Flight Now membership. Appreciate you. My mother joining us from the West Coast of the United States over in California. Hello there, Mom. Norman Reitzel, one of our wonderful channel members with a $10 super chat. Appreciate you, Norman. Jim Walls joining with channel membership at the pad leader level. Welcome aboard, Jim. We're glad to have you with us. And a thanks to Kixios for a one euro super chat. Appreciate that. We're in another period right now in between the ground stations. So looking to get on board camera views back in the next little bit as they complete the next handover. Likely transitioning to a ground station there in France. Also want to thank Clisty Lee, one of our wonderful moderators, for not only holding down the fort this afternoon here in the live chat, but also for gifting five Space Flight Now memberships. Really appreciate that, Clistia. And to our newest five channel members, welcome aboard. We're glad to have you with us. And if you haven't already, be sure to thank Clistia in the live chat.
We're currently at L plus 34 minutes, four seconds and counting. At this point, we are, oh, just about 20 or so minutes away from the ignition of the upper stage Dinshi engine. That burn again lasting just about 22 seconds in total, the second of three burns. Two burns are going to happen before the uh, CubeSats are deployed, and then there will be another burn prior to the capsule separation. But as we are sort of at a, a bit of a lull in the principal action here, Frederick, which who is, uh, of course, still at the European Space Agency headquarters there in Paris, is at the opportunity to pop downstairs and take the pulse of, you know, the, the VIPs who have gathered here for this opportunity, taking some time away from uh, potential soccer matches. So, you know, Frederick, going downstairs and seeing some of the folks that are around, what's, what's the mood? I'm sure it was jubilant. Exactly. The mood was jubilant, and uh, there, are, there are hundreds of people seated, but they were very joyful, applauding at every step of uh, the, the liftoff and then the, the next uh, operation of Iron Six. And everybody was, uh, was quite impressed, including some of my colleagues that I've seen, that everything went without a hitch. Uh, usually there are always a last minute thing about a green light, a red light on a minor detail or weather or things that here, okay, it, uh, everything went well, so people are very, very, very excited. Uh, among the the VIPs, you have a lot of VIPs, a lot of military. As I told you, the military are, are quite happy because uh, hopefully, if things go well until the end of the mission, uh, in the next mission or the next next mission, uh, th there is a critical um, intelligence satellite that the French military wants to have in orbit, and that's the kind of satellite that is not launched. On a, on the Falcon Nine, it's, it remains in France <laughs> or in French Guiana. So they are, they are, I'm sure they are relieved about seeing this uh, beginning of success. Then uh, we'll see. Uh, you had also Frédéric Dallest. Frédéric Dallest, of course, is not known, not even in, well in France, but is the father of the one of the two fathers of the Ariane. He is the guy who conceived Ariane in. Um, a long, a long time ago in the 70s, and uh, he, he was he was here very calm, no, no, no big speech, but he was happy to see that things are uh, going sm well and smoothly both. So we see that the okay, there is a next generation who is doing the doing the job, uh, and it's of course it's uh, it's a very it's very important because uh, Europe is. Uh, putting a lot of money to keep uh, its uh, autonomy to have this access to uh, to space uh, when i was speaking uh, i was speaking uh, yesterday with uh, the lady the min research minister who 10 years ago the french uh, uh, research minister who secretary let's say in, uh, who started this program and i was telling her okay it has it cost uh, it cost something over four billion dollars uh, to develop uh, iron six it took it's four years late and uh, and then there will be there will be some subsidies some subsidies and she told me but look of course it's expensive but first it's uh, it's an illusion to think that Rockets everywhere in the world are not just a commercial business, even after decades of space history. The, in the States, even the, the incredible success of uh, SpaceX, Falcon, and other companies is because NASA is here, because the Pentagon is, is here. So that's the big, rich institution. So uh, a rocket is an investment. At, at this point, she was telling me, uh, she's a... Uh, she, her name is Mrs. Fioraso, Geneviève Fioraso. She was telling, but look, uh, the money the, invested by China, the money invested by India uh, in space program, in Japan, everywhere. So to keep, to be still in the game, we need to be, to make these investments. And there are, there are 
not four four or five billion uh, dollars is not a huge amount, as we know, for a whole new generation of um, of a big uh, heavy launcher. So she was telling it's uh, it's a requirement if we if Europe if Europe wants to stay in the in the race, and even in the we saw this area in six. Uh, uh, development, it's only developed by 16 countries. So it's not all ESA. ESA is almost uh, uh, 30 countries uh, joining ESA. So it's um, and another aspect very important in Europe, not only it, it, there is this kind of geopolitical uh, importance of having uh, Ariane 6, but it's also for the industry. And uh, we were underlining earlier it's costly. It's of course it's much more costly to have an Ariane six than a Falcon nine because you have sixteen countries where their own industry is working on this program. So it's a little bit like in the uh, during the 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 Cold War where you had uh, all the areas aerospace industry in the states in a lot of different states. For first, for in, in terms of, of uh, risk, of geopolitical risk, but also for the industry, as we know, every state representative tried to have a, a part of the of the cake, a part of the uh, of the industry in their state. So it's even more important in Europe, where the countries want to invest, but they have they want to have also the industry. So it's very important. That's why we need to have new generation also of rockets. It's not just. Prog technical progress. It's also to keep the industry alive. Otherwise, the industry collapse. That's uh, what uh, a lot of politicians in Europe, not only in France, are underlining. And France is, uh, by the way, I was uh, checking the numbers, uh, is uh, investing 53, um, 53 or 54% uh, in this Syrian 6, when other countries put... Uh, much uh, much less so france is really the leading uh, the, the the leading force in this uh, program it has always been like this since uh, general de gaulle it's a long time ago it's a past history of france but uh, general de gaulle was invited in the early 60s in baikonur in a in a secret uh, secret uh, flight they they never told to the general uh, who was the president of France at the time that he would go to to Baikonur or where it was located. He was going just with his military attaché. There were two people to see a launch from Baikonur. And when he came back, he started the whole program, missiles on one side and civilian rockets on the other side. That's how they started the 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 idea, the concept of. Uh, having rockets and not to be dependent on foreign countries. And Mrs. Fioraso was telling me yesterday, we remember in the 70s, French people were very close, even closer than today, uh, working with, with NASA. And there was a European satellite called Symphony. And the, on the American side, it was NASA and the government say, oh, no problem, we launch uh, your satellite, you just pay the little part of it and we launch it. But then they say, oh, yeah, you can launch it, no problem. But uh, And they did launch from Cape Canaveral. But then they say, oh, you're, that's a communication satellite. You are forbidden to use it for commercial purposes. It's just for your country. So that, at that point, a lot of uh, European leaders say, okay, we need to have our own launcher. We won't depend uh, even on our best allies, uh, the U.S., the Americans, to have our autonomy, and that's why they invested so much, so much money, like other countries. And now all the big powers in the world uh, are investing bi not billions, dozens of billions of dollars in their program everywhere, and uh, except perhaps Russia, because Russia is, uh, has other troubles, so they have less money, but they're also the big initiators of these uh, space programs. This is my uh, presentation about, <laughs> but that was the sum up of the discussion I had uh, with the former minister, Mrs. Fioraso, who put really this area in six, she went all around Europe and was, she made the decision. So she's very happy and she's in Kuhu right now. Well, I, I think that's all 
you know, really excellent context to to put this moment in, and especially just picking up on the one of the last points you made of, you know, why, you know, because I'm sure there will be people watching this launch coverage and you know the future of the Ariane six rocket and thinking, well, you've got all these rockets from all these countries all over the world, you know, especially here in the United States, you know, SpaceX launching two three times maybe more a week, you know, why? Why is the Ariane 6 needed? And I think, you know, for exactly the reason you just mentioned, because it's not just, you know, the institutional missions that it's going to launch, but also being able to commercialize it and really tap into that marketplace that, you know, exists right now and will continue to flourish and, and blossom over the next 5, 10, 20 years from now. Uh, you know, it's important for there to be, you know, a rocket that, you know, Europe can depend on to be able to carry out those missions and, you know, not go through some extra hoops and hurdles to potentially launch, you know, from here in the States with, you know, Vulcan or uh, Falcon 9, Falcon Heavy, eventually uh, New Glenn. And, you know, going back to another point that you made of, you know, this having, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of subsidy investments on an annual basis, you know, I think folks can you know, look at the commercialization of a Falcon 9, a Falcon Heavy, for example, or even, um, you know, the the Vulcan rocket, which is launched one time so far, looking to launch at least a couple more times before the year is out, yeah. if all goes well. You know, SpaceX and ULA, you know, rely in no small part on getting very lucrative, uh, you know, federal contracts with the Department of Defense through the U.S. Space Systems Command on behalf of the Space Force, as well as the National Reconnaissance Office through uh, the National Security Space Launch procurement process, which they're getting ready to, you know, announce more of those awards later this year. Um, you yep. know, they announced the companies that are going to be vying for the, what's the, called the, the Lane 1 of, of this two-lane future contract. So a lot of, you know, federal dollars going into these, you know, commercial launchers, which also serve customer payloads. But it should not be, you know, lost in the the background of that. That, you know, they're still getting quite a bit of money from the federal government, and for developmental purposes too. Obviously, if you look at Launchpad Live right now, you can see a super heavy booster down there at Starbase in southern Texas, which is, yep. you know, getting ready to support the fifth flight of Starship. But you've got the Human Landing System Program, which is managed by NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center, offering a lot of their expertise to both SpaceX and Blue Origin. As they're getting their launchers or their landers, I should say, ready for future Artemis missions. So, all that to say, it's all you know tied into the governments where these launchers are based. However, commercialized they become on the one hand, you know, the tie to the nation that they're from is, and then the you know the sort of greater regional ecosystem, still very important. Case in point with the exactly. Ariane Six. Yeah, that's exactly. Okay. <clears throat> Yes, uh, there is. Uh, I don't know if we have time now, but also there is. A, there was a big debate uh, in, in Europe because, we, of course, everybody worldwide is impressed by the successes of Falcon Nine, and then there was this big debate: Oh, should uh, Europe had to to choose um, a reusable or partially reusable rocket? And as we know, Iron Six is not reusable. It's um, it's. It's the classical rocket where you lose uh, most of it. The, and that when I asked this question to the top manager of ESA, of CNES, the French space agency, they told, they told me, we don't have enough, we don't have enough satellites to launch to justify a reusability of the, of the rocket. Th that's a basic thing. Uh, on the average, they, they are targeting about uh, nine launches per year with uh, with Ariane 6, a reusable uh, rocket costs much more money than uh, a classical rocket like Ariane 6. And then what do you do uh, uh, with uh, if you have only nine launches per year? That doesn't work. You need at least the, the equation here in Europe is that you need at least 25 launches a year to justify a reusable system. Otherwise, it doesn't work economically at all that is um the analysis yeah. here yeah and i think that's 
part of the the calculus that ULA is also factoring in with the Vulcan rocket and getting them to that 25 launch per year cadence with that vehicle and looking at ways that they can reuse the B4 engines on the uh, the booster stage there. So yeah, that makes sense that that's about that threshold. Yeah. Okay. And um, uh, so what we... Yeah. Go ahead, please. please. The, the, the amazing thing, you know, we, we have time, and uh, the amazing thing is that during, I was uh, checking, uh, I followed Ariane from uh, the first Ariane L01 in this very same building at the headquarters. Um, it's amazing that during three decades, the um, Ariane program, the Ariane 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, they were leading the... Um, the commercial market by far i mean it's two-thirds of the satellites worldwide not just uh, in the western world were launched by iran and that was i think for two reasons when i was looking at that and speaking to uh, former managers is that first of course it was an outstanding rocket we said it already that's why we could put james webb on uh, on such kind of rocket but also the it was a golden age for Ariane until, let's say, five, ten years ago because of the shuttle strategy in the U.S. It's when, once they, the, the U.S. decided to have only the shuttle for uh, manned space flights and uh, commercial satellites, and then you had Challenger and uh, Vito. Yes, you want to, to comment, perhaps? Oh, just just to let folks know what, what you're seeing here on the side of the screen. Of this is a, a launch replay. Of course, there's not yeah. just a, a secret Ariane 6 that's launching for a second time. Uh, just just to <laughs> clarify that for anyone who might be confused as to what's happening. It launched it's... more than 51 minutes ago. This is just a, a multi-camera view replay of it with uh, some really nice uh, angles there. But anyway, you were, you were saying. Yeah, I know. It's very important to have yeah, the different cameras that were analyzing the exactly the how the launcher behaves uh, so uh, so i was saying that uh, this uh, Ariane was so lucky somehow to be not only a very good technology but also to be the only game in town so of course once uh, the white house decided to to stop to forbid uh, the shuttle to be used for commercial purposes okay and most of the rockets classical rockets in the US was didn't exist anymore because of this policy. Of course, the uh, people had to rely on uh, on Ariane. So it makes the the best years. And even at the time, we say, okay, Ariane and Ariane Space made a lot of money, and it's true, they made a lot of money. But still, you need some government countries to invest in uh, the rocket industry to make it livable and to make it even uh, to have some commercial activity with it. You cannot go from scratch and to do a business out of a rocket. You need always big, big investments. Absolutely. And the for our, our viewers watching right now, the reason that we're getting some views back inside uh, launch control is we are now just a little less than four minutes away from the ignition of the Vinci upper stage engine, which will perform a nominal uh, 22 second burn. So it's coming up at T plus 56 minutes, 20 seconds. So we may hear again from the, the DDO in the next couple of minutes here. So we'll try not to uh, let our, our commentary cross over on that. And actually, let's go ahead and we'll, we'll pull back on our commentary for now until we get through that burn and then we'll be back with you with more commentary on the other side just since we don't know exactly when their call outs are going to come and we want to be sure to listen into this moment is a, a very key part of the mission right now the first time that a vinci engine will nominally reignite in space
just as a quick note before we pull back on the commentary again, as we cross the 55 minute mark, as you can see from the telemetry data above the views in the Jupiter room and the animation view of the upper stage of the Ariane 6 rocket, looking for acquisition of signal from the ground station there in Australia. So looking to get some upper stage views, hopefully before the ignition of the Vinci upper stage engine, which will perform a 22 second burn that's coming up now in less than a minute. Acquisition de la télémesure par la station de Nounorcia. Deuxième allumage Vinci. A good call out from Instinction du moteur Vinci. Good call out from the DDO there. Some celebration in the room. As we heard the call that the Vinci engine ignited and then cut off again as nominally expected. So, Frederick, uh, bringing it back here again, um, I took a little bit of French in high school and college, but I admit I'm a little rusty these days. So if you wouldn't mind playing translator for us and, and relaying what we, what we're okay, hearing so from the DDO. Yes, the, the end of the burn of the, uh, of the Vinci worked perfect. The Vinci cutoff was good. And uh, the second Vinci boost worked well and now we just uh, uh we are expecting the apu auxiliary propulsion unit to cut off in a few minutes and everything looks nominal they are quite happy about it and we heard the uh, applaud and people applauding in kuru but also here at the isa headquarters things yeah, are certainly. looking good <laughs> certainly the calls they want to hear and uh, the director general is posting on X, formerly Twitter, that with that burn, the upper stage has now circularized its orbit as they're preparing to calma. deploy the first set of CubeSats. So, like you were saying, uh, Frederick, just a you know a, a good marker of success so far with this mission. Obviously, you don't want to count your chickens before they all hatch, but so far the the first couple of eggs seem to be you know have hatched pretty well. Yeah, yeah the people uh, st start to breathe again. <laughs> the most critical things are going well. And um, the sequence of the mission is, uh, is, going, is going on and uh, exactly as expected. You know, and one of the things we, we did touch on this earlier in the broadcast, but, you know, now that we've actually seen the reignition and a uh, good burn, a good shutdown of the Vinci engine. Can you just really, for for those who, you know, are are used to a, a Falcon Nine launch, 
you know, and, and its ability to reignite the, the Merlin vacuum engine, how big of a deal it is for the Ariane, you know, vehicle now to have this capability of doing, you know, as you were mentioning, up five relights of this engine. It's uh... It's very, it's very important because, of course, during the golden age we were describing where Iran was the leading uh, uh, rocket on the commercial ma market worldwide, uh, most at the time, most of the satellites, almost all of them, were going to geo, geostationary orbit. And so the launch was just uh, one shot almost to put to, just to go to the air. Uh, higher higher point of the orbit and then to circularize and that was it now with the constellation the game is totally different and the, the it has totally changed at the time 10 years 20 years ago that didn't exist so uh, really they built when they started this Iran 6 program the idea was exactly to fit the market with with this critical uh, Vinci engine, and uh, that's of course to it's it's exactly the the vehicle needed on the market, and that's uh, crucial to the success of Ariane Six. Yeah, Jean-Luc, you were saying. Yeah, and so far it seems like it's performing as well as they expected it to. Um, you know, they they're not going to need uh, you know as much capability as it possibly can handle, but certainly um you know it's it's got a good way so far with this mission want to bring in the we can the ESA broadcast uh visually not not the audio Stephen, into our view here just as they're reviewing some of the payloads that are going to be deployed with this mission so just to give our audience a visual of some of the things that are going to be sent off into orbit coming up in the next few minutes the uh, shutoff of the auxiliary propulsion unit happens at t plus one hour five minutes and 36 seconds and then the first separation command will be issued at uh, t plus one hour five minutes and 53 seconds the second three seconds after that and then the third about uh, six seconds after that so things will be moving pretty quickly coming up in the next several minutes and we're just getting a visual overview of some of the payloads that are on board here. So, Frederick, as we're taking a look at some of these CubeSats that are going to be released in the next few minutes, uh, notable comparing this first inaugural launch to the first Ariane 5 mission, that they decided to send off these uh, array of CubeSats as opposed to, you know, a much larger singular dedicated mission. Can you speak to the significance of, of that and maybe some of the thinking behind putting these types of payloads on board for this first flight? I think it was a good compromise because uh, uh, 26 years ago, um, when they launched in 1996, uh, the first Iran 5, uh, I remember the, it was amazing. All the engineers and managers would tell you, oh, we have the, 
the most reliable launcher in the world. Before launch, I was saying that because Ariane 5, and it was true, has been built for a, a small European shuttle called Herm Hermes. And uh, so it was built with, a, it's, it's true, with some uh, specification of manned space flight. And uh, so they were so almost arrogant about, oh, it's the most reliable thing before flying it. And at the time, they choose to put these uh, clusters satellites, um, uh, which were uh, uh, in, an incredible research mission for hundreds of uh, PhD students. So it was risky. We, yeah, go ahead, please. Oh, sorry to, to cut you off. We're just uh, no uh, problem. Less than ten seconds away from that first separation command. Ex so exactly. Yes. Let's go ahead and listen in and see if we can hear the DDO call out. Extinction that. APU. APU auxiliary propulsion unit cut off was good confirmed. A few seconds away from. Début de la, like this first. la séquence de séparation des CubeSat. So we've got onboard video now. And we'll see. Yep, there we go. Some actual deployment video of those CubeSats. Yep. So at this point in the at this point all of the CubeSats should have been deployed. Is that the, the call that we just heard? Yes. Confirmed, yes. <clears throat> they are so happy that the CubeSat have been released properly. Exactly at the on the timeline and the right schedule. They are very small. Uh... Satellites, but uh, everything works well. The release. At the right altitude. And, and just to go back to what we were talking about a second ago of, you know, the decision to have this as the principal payload. Do you think so... that, you know, it's still the was still the, the right call? Um, or do you think, you know, given the success they've seen so far that they maybe were wishing they'd had a, a large no. payload on board? Or, or was this, you know, the right sort of risk uh, management for something like this mission? No, it's risk management because at the time it was difficult, very difficult to have a reflight. They lost hundreds of millions of dollars with the four clusters. Hundreds of um, PhD students couldn't uh, do their work until they rebuilt it. And I remember the science director promised to find the money to have a reflight, but uh, that was uh, quite uh, difficult and costly. So uh, the rule of the game is to, okay, to go in um, with a classical approach and to put some margin before flying uh, expensive and critical payloads. And um, CubeSats, and even as we know, the the the, the first mass is a neutral mass made with, uh, I think, concrete or something similar to that, which is a neutral mass uh, on which uh, the CubeSats are where where now where uh, uh, installed. Gosh, yeah. It did just speaking to sort of more inert style payloads, of course, you know, as we and, and others have reported, <clears throat> United Launch Alliance is having to pivot to an inert payload for their second certification mission on the Vulcan rocket because, you know, the, the Dream Chaser space plane is not ready to fly on time yeah. and they need to get that rocket certified so they can start flying their uh, important national security customer missions later this year. So. That's like we're getting some audio in from the Jupiter room. Let's listen in for a second. They are jubilant, yes. 
we'll have the official speeches now of the key managers. When they apply like this, is that they are okay? They are. They know that it's one hundred percent successful. That's got to be a good feeling. And obviously, congratulations have already started coming in from folks like the uh, NASA administrator. Let's listen in. Yeah, you can. Uh, you can see the so very warm welcome to director of, of ESA, uh, DG. Uh, also, of course, here in Kourou. The ad it is electric here. There's such a good mood. There's such a, a fantastic feeling here. But let me really just express uh, a few emotions from my side. A big thank you to all of those people who have worked on this launcher. We are making history now. We are making history. We are succeeding. We still have a bit of work to do, just to be very precise. But we have made very important steps. We had the third, uh, we had the separation, the third separation command of the payload. We had the APU, uh, we, we had the APU firing and cut off. We had the upper stage firing cut off. The Vinci engine. Uh, everything is nominal. Everything is going so well, and this is such a beautiful moment. So thank you, industry. Thank you, task force members. Uh, uh, Arian Group, uh, Arian Spass, uh, CNES, uh, we have been working together with my team of ESA. Everyone has been really giving its best to make this a success. It's a historic day for ESA. It's a historic day for space in Europe. It's a historic day for Europe because this fires up, powers up Europe because we need the data from the satellites that our Ariane rocket uh, will launch in the future. So big thank you, big day to celebrate from our side. So Joseph, uh, Joseph has said it all, so I'm not sure I have much more to say, but Europe is back. Europe is back in space, so this is perhaps a, this is a very important This is the moment. boss Thank you very much. Thank you, of, of the course, French also Space to, Agency. Uh, French Guiana, to CSJ team, who has been working very, very well and, uh, and was very challenged over the last few years, so it's a great moment, and, uh, and Europe is back in space. So thanks a lot. So good afternoon, good evening in Europe. Today, Ariane is back. <laughs> and today, with this new launcher, Europe is restoring its autonomous access to space, and we all know how important this is for all of us. But what I would like to share as a feeling is uh, first my sense of relief, it's quite visible <laughs> after such a, a success, but also a sense of pride for all the teams who have been working for this program. The thousands of rocket makers from Ariane Group, from all the European industrial partners from 13 countries who have been working tirelessly on this program to overcome the challenges. It has been a difficult program, and their work enables us today to see such a brilliant success. So I'd like to congratulate all of you, to thank all of you, and really I'm proud of your talent and your dedication. Second topic, because we've got customers here, is that now we have to ramp up uh, production to serve our customers. It is already ongoing, and it starts by a next launch, before a year end, and this will be another uh, interesting episode in the saga. And the last topic I'd like to mention is that the mission is not yet completed. The upper stage is still in orbit, maneuvering, and we are expecting a lot of precious information to prepare for the future. So, go Ariane 6, go! I want first uh, to thank uh, all the member states who have uh, participated in the funding of the program. We have uh, here uh, former minister Geneviève Furazo, we have Anna Chrisman, uh, space coordinator in Germany, and uh, it would not have been possible without their continuous support. So thanks to all of the member states of ISA who made this success possible. 
the, the second thing I want to say is to, as said by Martin, to congratulate all teams. This decision has been made uh, since a decade, and all teams who have worked for this success uh, in uh, the agencies, uh, in industry, uh, is uh, an outstanding uh, Team Europe, and uh, today it is their success, and they must be very proud of what they have achieved. And last but not least, it's our customers. During these years, the customers stand on our side. We have a backlog of 29 launches to deliver for both institutional and commercial customers. It would not have been possible without their trust and without their loyalty to Iron Space. So my thought now is going to our customers who have been on our side, and now we must deliver. And I am very proud to announce that what has been achieved since one hour and six minutes and what is currently being achieved allows us to make a mission for the French MOD by the end of the year, and it would be the second mission of IN6 and the first operational mission. Thank you very much. Looks like they're giving a little bit of love to the DDO there, who's obviously been hard at work in this mission. Not going to take the mic by the looks of it, but lots of thumbs up and applause. And someone next to him on console, you know, tapped his shoulder, yeah. made sure he looked around, said, hey, you know, take your moment in the sun because you, you aren't along with those guys upstairs. So just to sort of bookend what we were just hearing from all of those figureheads, Frederick, um, you know, culminating in that uh, final statement, which you had, you know, talked about earlier in the broadcast of uh, the, the next mission being the first operational flight for Ariane 6, an important uh, government operational mission. Can you talk a little bit more about that from your reporting on, on this upcoming flight? So for the first time, and I think perhaps it was a diplomatic mistake, I'm not sure, when uh, Stefan Israel, the Aryan space, the, so the entity which commercialized uh, Ariane, said uh, that uh, by the end of the year we have a military payload on board. I think it was should have an, been announced by the defense ministry and the people in charge, but I, Perhaps has been. I, I don't know the details, but usually, anyway, he made his job as a as the for, for the business of Arian, and uh, he he announced that it will that will be the next uh, uh, payload. So that's the French uh, the French uh, defense that will um, that, that that will launch. Uh, excuse me. Uh, can, can I Willie? Can I w one second because we have Julio. I have yes, to catch him. He's a very important person. Yes. As we mentioned a little bit earlier in our broadcast, we're going to be joined in a minute or two here by Julio uh, Bonreal, who is a former Marion Launch Director of Operations and has extensive experience in performing uh, duties on console for the Ariane program. So looking forward to talking with him. So we're just going to get that set up and we'll bring him into the conversation as well. It's been a busy morning or evening for, for him, certainly, uh, you know, getting through all the launch operations and reaching this milestone. 